Good morning, everyone. It's my honor today to be joined uh, by two distinguished members of the freshman class, Congresswoman Carolyn Boudreaux from Georgia, Congressman Frank Mervan uh, from the great state of Indiana. Uh, and of course, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, our vice chair, Pete Aguilar. Uh, we concluded the House Democratic Caucus meeting earlier today in high spirits and excited about the opportunities that lie ahead because of the legislation that will be passed on the floor of the House of Representatives this week. The American Rescue Plan is transformative. It will comprehensively and compassionately meet the moment as a result of the devastating COVID-19 pandemic. Leadership matters. Vaccinations are up, infections are down, $1,400 survival checks are on the way. And that is only the beginning. House Democrats, in partnership with Senate Democrats and with great leadership from President Biden and Vice President Harris, promised to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in a transformational way. The American Rescue Plan is a transformational piece of legislation. We promised to put vaccination shots in arms for every single American, mission accomplished. We promised to put money in the pockets of everyday Americans who've been struggling through the economic trauma of the pandemic, mission accomplished. We promised to make sure that children can go back to school safely. Mission accomplished. We promised to send people back to work by helping to revive and supercharge the economy. Mission accomplished. We promised to help small businesses. Mission accomplished. Leadership matters. And we're thankful for the leadership of President Biden, his administration in partnership with House Democrats and Senate Democrats to get things done for the American people. But we're not going to stop there. This week, we will also have important gun violence prevention, legislative measures voted on the floor, and we expect that they will pass with bipartisan support. America has 4% of the world's population, 40% of the world's guns. And because of loopholes that currently exist in the law, many of those guns find their way into the hands of criminals who are intent on doing harm to the American people. And we've seen mass shooting after mass shooting after mass shooting. Enough. And that is why we will move forward with the bipartisan background check bill, uh, as well as with closing the Charleston loophole. We also are going to take an important step forward in terms of passing the right to organize, act, and protecting the ability of everyday Americans to collectively bargain, to organize themselves, and to be able to speak with a voice that gives them a fair shot to negotiate fair wages, fair health care, fair benefits went up against multinational corporations and intense corporate power. The American dream has been slipping for decades, in part because of the dramatic decline in union density facilitated by an unrelenting attack on the ability of everyday Americans to organize themselves. That is why we will be protecting the right to organize in the House this week. And I yield to the distinguished vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus, Pete Aguilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right now, the House is prepared to pass, once again, the American Rescue Plan. This legislation represents the boldest action 
taken on behalf of the American people since the Great Depression and will give us the tools to build back better. It'll put money in people's pockets. It will cut poverty in half, cut child poverty in half, and it will give our communities the resources they need to safely reopen schools. It will ramp up vaccination rates to crush this virus, and Republicans in both the House and the Senate uniformly opposed it. We should be clear that this legislation has broad bipartisan support from the American public across the country. House Democrats remain focused on delivering results for the American people to meet this moment while House Republicans are focused on Dr. Seuss. I'm proud to support this bill and I look forward to seeing the profound impact that it will have in communities like mine and across this country. With that, I'd like to introduce my colleague from Georgia, Representative Carolyn Bordeaux. Good morning, and thank you, Vice Chair Aguilar, for that introduction, and thank you, Chairman Jeffries, for your remarks. I'm also pleased to be here today with my fellow freshman, uh, Congressman Frank Mervin from Indiana. I ran for office in Georgia on the promise of getting my community the COVID help it needed and still needs. Throughout my campaign and the campaign for the two Senate seats, we would often say on the trail, vote like your life depends on it because it does. That wasn't just a clever line. More than 500,000 Americans have died from COVID-19, including over 17,000 Georgians. We're about to close on another milestone of around a million infected. Hundreds of thousands more are suffering from the long-term impact of the disease. And just a few days ago, I got a letter from a teacher who is on kidney dialysis because of blood clots caused by COVID. Many small businesses are operating at a fraction of their capacity. Families are exhausted. My nine-year-old son, like so many, has been in digital learning for a year starting this month. This week, we will fulfill the promise that we made to the people in Georgia and this country when the House sends the American Rescue Plan to President Biden for his signature. We are voting on a bill that will save lives and livelihoods. Though we've made a lot of progress, including the remarkable development of three COVID vaccines in less than a year, we still have a long way to go. My husband used to wake up every day and ask, dear Lord, when are they gonna have a vaccine? And now he wakes up every day and says, when are we gonna get the vaccine? The American Rescue Plan will help us get shots in arms, will increase funding for testing, the development of new therapies, and the expansion of the public health workforce. If there's one thing, though, that COVID has taught us, it is how our social safety net has fallen short. There are many important provisions in this bill to shore up our working families, but there is one I really want to focus on in particular in Georgia, because Georgia is one of the top states in the nation for the number of uninsured. In my district, Georgia's seventh, 14% of our population, 120,000 people, lack health insurance. And that was before the pandemic. I want to be clear that most of these people are working and are either too poor to uh, be able to get a subsidy to purchase health insurance on the exchange or simply can't afford to pay the extortionary health insurance prices that we face in Georgia. There are people in my community who hold good jobs, are in two-income families, and live in nice homes, but they still struggle to afford health insurance because many of them have to pay between two and $3,000 every month. The American Rescue Plan says enough is enough and caps health care insurance premiums for families that purchase on the exchange at 8.5% of their income. This is going to be very important to expanding health insurance coverage in Georgia and across the country. Then there is Medicaid expansion. There are 12 states in the country that have yet to expand Medicaid, and my state of Georgia is one of them. The American Rescue Plan gives a major incentive to each of those 12 states to do so by giving states like Georgia a second chance to expand Medicaid and get higher federal matching rate for Medicaid expenses. Our governor has been complaining about not getting enough state aid in the rescue package, even though he would not support the bill anyway but he also leaves approximately $1.9 billion on the table in federal money each year to expand Medicaid and ensure health insurance for around 500,000 people in Georgia and save rural hospitals. Expanding Medicaid is not just the right thing to do, it is the smart thing to do, 
Not only will more people have health insurance, but in Georgia, the cost of uncompensated care is baked into our high health insurance premiums. Finally, I would be remiss to stand up here and not also mention the For the People Act that we passed last week. After an election with record-breaking turnout, the Georgia General Assembly passed yet another bill yesterday to make it harder for working people to vote by eliminating no-excuse absentee voting in Georgia. This isn't about politics. It's about making it easier to vote. It's about protecting working people who don't have the time or ability to leave their jobs in the middle of the workday to go vote. If we only let people who vote 9 to 5, we're going to lose hundreds of thousands of voters who vote early in the morning, late in the afternoon, or on weekends, or who use no excuse absentee ballots to vote. In 2005, it was Republicans who enacted no excuse absentee voting in Georgia, and now they're changing their tune, and politics is the reason why. I proudly voted for the For the People Act to push back on these efforts in Georgia and in state legislatures around the country, and because our right to vote is sacred. Thank you so much, and I yield to my co colleague, Congressman Frank Morvan. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I am Frank J. Mervan. I represent uh, the Indiana's first congressional district. Uh, I have walked on the picket lines. I have chanted one day longer, one day stronger. I've been in the union halls when people have been on strike and they've given up their incomes and their health insurance in order to have a collective voice. I also sat across the table from individuals who have lost or been displaced from their job based on policies that are no control of their own. And today, I am proud to say that I and the United States Democratic Caucus have a message to the union sisters and brothers. We have your back. Just like in communities across and throughout our nation, unions are the backbone of Northwest Indiana's economy. My district is a manufacturing hub and one of the largest steel producing regions in the nation. Uh, and that, that success is because of the United Steelworkers the international longshoremen work at the Port of Indiana moving, moving iron and ore and goods and products throughout Lake Michigan. And for all members of the building trades and the construction trades use the steel and the products to create and manufacture products that support our national co economy and our national security. For, for too long, states and federal policies have targeted unions to weaken their leverage and their position. That changes today. I am proud the House Democrats are leading the way by voting this week on H.R. 824, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. When workers stand together and form a union, they have the ability to use, collect, use a collective voice for fair wages, safe working conditions, improved health benefits, and a secure retirement. Organized labor is essential to creating opportunities for individuals to have a good paying career and a family sustaining job and the pride and the dignity of work. I am also proud to vote and today on the American Recovery Plan. These two measures give a balance and lift up working families. In my opinion, part of our great divide in our nation is workers feel left behind. These two acts lift up workers and give them a chance. I thank you and I yield back to the chairman. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Frank. Questions? Mission accomplished is pretty strong for a bill you haven't voted on yet. I mean, are you 100 percent confident you're going to have the votes to do this? I'm 110 percent confident that the votes exist to pass the American Rescue Plan. And any uh, updated guidance on when that might happen? I expect that the bill will be taken. We're still waiting on the bill to come over from the Senate. And so from a timing standpoint, the clock will start to tick uh, when the Senate transmits the bill uh, back to the House of Representatives, and then the Rules Committee will take it up. Once the Rules Committee takes it up, they'll send it to the floor and we'll pass it, hopefully uh, with some Republican votes, although, you know, that remains to be seen. What's perplexing to a lot of us is that the American Rescue Plan is bipartisan across the country. Seventy to 75 percent of the American people support it. A majority of Republicans support it. Over 70 percent of independent voters support it. The Chamber of Commerce supports the American Rescue Plan. The Business Roundtable supports the American Rescue Plan. Republican mayors, 
Republican town supervisors, Republican governors, Republican county executives. But a single Republican House member or Senate member can't be found when we're in the midst of a once in a century pandemic. So the question is not whether we're going to pass the American Rescue Plan. We will. The question is whether Republicans are going to step up on behalf of their constituents and support this effort to decisively crush the virus and provide relief to everyday Americans. What do you attribute that discrepancy, that it does poll so well with Republicans and yet Republican lawmakers won't touch it? I mean, it's unclear to me. House Democrats are the party of crushing the coronavirus and providing relief to everyday Americans. House Republicans are the party of fake outrage as it relates to Dr. Seuss. It's a strange thing. You mentioned that this bill is transformative. Can you unpack that a little bit? Are we in a new era, change the relationship between government and people? Is this a new era of bigger government, more bold initiatives? What does it mean to be transformative? Well, I want to let my colleagues respond as well, but, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is both a public health crisis and an economic crisis. It's a once in a century pandemic and therefore requires a once in a century, comprehensive, compassionate, and continuing congressional response. That is exactly what the American Rescue Plan represents. And so we've just met the moment with great leadership from President Biden and of course, Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Schumer, as well as our respective caucuses. We also need to build back better, and there's several provisions within the American Rescue Plan that address the economic pain and suffering that far too many everyday Americans have been experiencing. We will lift 50% of the children who are in poverty right now out of poverty. We will make sure that we deal with the food insecurity needs of the American people, the housing needs of the American people, the unemployment needs of the American people. The American Rescue Plan is transformative because that is what the moment requires. This bill is transformative because of the details of the bill. As the chairman mentioned, lifting children out of poverty, increasing supplemental nutrition, expanding the earned income tax credit, putting checks in everyday Americans' pockets, those are the things that the American public are going to view that matter. Those are the things that matter in our communities. As millions of Americans look to file their taxes, as millions of Americans uh, look at um, uh, the direct contributions that come into their account, those are the things that matter to people. And so I would say that it's transformative because these are also you know, policy objectives that we have been talking about for decades that matter, that matter to people. So while in the halls here, Republicans can have this fake outrage, we know in our communities, this bill matters. I had a, I zoomed into a local city council uh, last night. I'll be doing four more city councils uh, this evening talking with my local elected leaders about what this bill does for them. Plugging the financial gaps so we can keep libraries open, keep essential workers hired, fixing streets, fixing roads, protecting those employees in our cities, in our towns, in our counties. Those are the policies that are going to matter to the public. And I, I just want to give one scenario about the American Recoveries Act. Uh, in my previous elected position, I did emergency assistance. And so a tin mill went, uh, lost its employees because it closed down. And uh, when the employee lost his job, he couldn't afford COBRA. And he came to me and I did emergency assistance. And with COBRA, they couldn't afford health insurance. And the American Recoveries Plan does that. It offers a stimulus advantage for individuals to afford COBRA to go through that transition to be able to find work and provide the essential health work for their families. So when you ask when it's transformable, it's everyday lives of people getting through these challenges and now having government working for their advantage against uh, odds and a pandemic that we haven't faced in 100 years and an economic crisis that matches that.
Nope. I second uh, what my colleagues have said, but just want to go back to the issue in Georgia, for instance, that this would allow Georgia to expand Medicaid. Uh, this would dramatically increase the number of people who can purchase health insurance uh, in my district and across the state. And uh, it also has an enormous anti-poverty component uh, with the expansion of the earned income tax credit, uh, the expansion of the child tax credit, which will lift over 50 percent of children out of poverty. And all of these are transformative policies that are woven throughout this bill. Is this Anthony Brown's letter? I think it's uh, Rep. Waltz. Okay, well, I'm not familiar with Rep. Waltz's letter, although you may be referring to uh, the letter that was co-authored by Congressman Anthony Brown, and I do support the effort uh, to arrive at a robust renegotiation uh, of the nuclear agreement, which I supported in its original form to meet the current challenges of the moment. And just as a follow-up, uh, is there anything that you can give us on the recent Houthi attacks on uh, Saudi Arabia? Uh, I've got no statement on that right now at the moment. Thank you. Sir, uh, you're talking about uh, transformative legislation. It's a transformative piece of legislation that creates a fiscal cliff next year when um, the child tax credits expire. Um, you talk about lifting kids out of poverty. You have the potential of putting them back the poverty line when that expires. Uh, or doesn't that just sort of put you guys in a tough spot here in six, eight months down the line? Well, it's a good question. I support uh, the permanent extension of the robust child tax credit that is included in the American Rescue Plan. I believe the House Democratic Caucus supports a permanent extension. And in the conversations that we've had with the administration, they've signaled their support as well. It's an issue to be worked on uh, as we approach the next fiscal year, and I'm confident that uh, we may even find some bipartisan support. As you know, in the Senate, though they didn't vote for the American Rescue Plan, both Senator Romney and Senator Rubio have championed an expanded child tax credit, and I expect that there's some common ground that we'll be able to find with them and others uh, as we pursue making this important step forward permanent. So how do you pay for that? A trillion dollars over 10 years? Well, that's a question to be explored uh, at the moment and that we confront it, which will be uh, in the context of next year's spending bill. And so let's see where we are. I know Chairman Neal, for instance, uh, has some ideas. The other point to make uh, in this area is that one, we also believe that it pays for itself because when you lift up uh, children out of poverty in such a dramatic way, that has a positive impact on the economy, that has a positive impact on the decline in the need for governmental services that would otherwise be required uh, when you have children who are living in poverty. And so it's a conversation to be explored at the appropriate uh, moment. I know it's something that we're already thinking about. Uh, but we have to get through passing the American Rescue Plan first. Okay. Uh, we'll go there and then to the back. Yeah. Uh, on immigration, you've seen the reports. There's a surge at the border. A lot of the new arrivals are children, and, and according to these reports, it sounds like the conditions in some cases are pretty dismal in these detention centers. Um, you Democrats were very critical of the Trump administration handling of similar situations. Um, how do you think the Biden administration is doing, and what is Congress? Well, the Biden administration, I think, is doing well, uh, and it's going to approach the situation on the border in a compassionate fashion, uh, which is 180 degrees the opposite of the approach that the Trump administration took at the border. Cruelty was the point when it comes to the way that the Trump administration handled the humanitarian crisis at the border. Compassion, lifting up the rule of law, and the fact that we're a nation of immigrants who embrace uh, the idea that people who come to our borders seeking asylum should be given a meaningful opportunity to be heard. I expect that all of those principles will be lifted up 
by the Biden administration as it confronts this crisis. And also, it's important to note, and then I'll yield to Pete, who has been working hard and one of, is one of our leaders on the immigration issue, is that in the comprehensive immigration reform bill that is being championed by Linda Sanchez on behalf of the Biden administration, there's a plan to deal with the humanitarian situation in the Central American Northern Triangle countries, in particular of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. There's a plan to deal with the violence, the poverty, and the corruption. And at the end of the day, um, it's that type of forward-looking intervention in the areas of need that result in the migration that we then see at the border that will be the ultimate solution. And I know that's something that the Biden administration is committed to undertaking. This is a process, what the Biden administration is doing, that will be rooted in compassion. And so that's the, the difference. What we saw in the Trump administration was intentional child separation and no effort to reunite families. And so now we've turned the page and individuals who are claiming lawful asylum will be viewed just that way. There is a process for this. The Biden administration will move toward that process and we will hold them accountable just like we did the prior administration to ensure that they're following the law. Their process right now is to use the ORR uh, process to move these uh, migrants, these children into ORR health and human services facilities as quickly as possible given COVID restrictions. So that's what they are going to do. Um, but this is a process that is rooted in compassion, and that's the difference between the prior administration and this administration. And like the chairman said, you don't address this until you deal with the Northern Triangle issues. That's what the U.S. Citizenship Act does. That's what we look forward to working with the committees of jurisdiction, foreign affairs, and appropriations committees on in the future uh, to help address this. But we will also ensure that there's accountability and oversight uh, to, what's, to what's going on. Just quick follow In the very near term, I understand the Northern Triangle situation, that's a much longer term solution. In the near term, you know, these facilities are being described as jails. And as you're shifting them to the HHS facilities, is there anything Congress can do to ease, those, to ease that situation down? Well, I know there are ongoing conversations between the chairs of jurisdiction and many uh, different members of Congress with the Biden administration to try to address uh, the conditions that you've raised. Uh, I haven't seen where they've been described as jails, uh, but as Pete indicated, I think we are confident that the Biden administration is going to approach the humanitarian situation at the border anchored in compassion as opposed to anchored in cruelty. Last question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jeffrey. Uh, you're set to lose one member to confirmation, Senate confirmation tomorrow, and another one in the coming weeks. How concerned are you about a shrinking Democratic majority, which is already one of the small, smallest that you've had, uh, going forward with legislation and possibly losing votes? Not concerned at all. We're incredibly unified around a progressive, forward-looking, transformational agenda uh, that we've undertaken from the moment this new Congress uh, was sworn in. And I think, as you've seen, we continue to pass meaningful pieces of legislation on the floor each and every week, including the bills uh, that we will undertake this particular week. That's because we recognize that the American people are facing real challenges that require real solutions. And we're committed to making sure uh, that we get things done. So there's no concern about losing progressives who might be getting antsy down the line. They've already spoken up about some of the changes with, uh, with the American Rescue Act. So no concerns down the line with them getting antsy, being like, no, we don't like some of these changes the Senate do. We're not going to sort of go along with it. Senate is a unique and peculiar institution, uh, but that's the reality of the constitutional fabric that we confront. By and large, I think what you've seen is a recognition across the country, not simply within the halls of Congress, that the American Rescue Plan meets the moment and is transformational. 
and will really impact the lives of everyday Americans in a positive way. And it's an incredible contrast. The, the, the Republicans, when they had an opportunity to act on behalf of the American people in 2017, passed the GOP tax scam and saddled our children and our grandchildren and our country with $1.9 trillion in debt, where 83% of the benefits went to the wealthiest 1% in America in order to subsidize the lifestyles of the rich and shameless. That is what they did with their majority. After inheriting the Barack Obama, Joe Biden economy that was going well at the time. Now we find ourselves in a crisis and not a single one of them can support the American Rescue Plan. So the challenge is not with Democrats. We're going to remain uh, united, I believe, and unified. And as Senator Bernie Sanders himself said, after voting to support the American Rescue Plan, this is the most progressive bill passed by the Congress in at least a quarter century. He's a leading progressive. And so I don't think there's any anxiety as it relates to moving forward uh, with the legislation that will be on the floor this week. Let me just say briefly, and I know I speak on behalf of the House Democratic Caucus, that we are so thrilled for uh, our colleague, uh, Deb Holland and Marsha Fudge, two exceptionally qualified members of Congress. My only regret is that two of my colleagues here aren't going to be able to, to work with those two um, in the halls of Congress, but we will work with them to champion uh, progress for the American people. We are concerned, we are focused on delivering real results and governing, and that's what separates our caucus with the other side of the aisle is we want to focus on results and governing. That's why we're going to put up a strong vote. That's why we will continue to put up strong votes for background checks, for protecting the right to organize. Next week, violence against women, uh, DACA and TPS uh, protections, ag worker modernization, equal rights amendment. Those are the things that we want to be judged by, our ability to govern and our ability uh, to put up votes. And so that's what we want to do on behalf of the American public. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the party of the American Rescue Plan versus the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Ted Cruz, and Dr. Seuss is not really a fair fight. Thank you very much.